some of the papers today as well. We need time to take a look at a few of the papers with Jenny Critchlow, who's based in Clavedon, a self-help expert who has a podcast and runs the Peace Gym. We can say a very good morning to you. Uh, how are you doing, Jenny? Good morning, Jenny? Richard. Yes, I'm good. Really thank well, you. thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. Do you know what? It's, it's lovely being in the office for a couple of days and being able to present and sit behind a desk and just that sort of you see the regular names and chat to you guys on the phone and see the text coming in. It's, it's lovely. I'm really enjoying it, Jenny, oh, as you can probably tell. Uh, listen, I've had a flip through the papers today. There are lots of stories in there. Jen, let's uh, have a look at some of the ones that you have picked out. And we're going to start off with The Guardian, which has gone, uh, why the cult of a perfect mother has to end. Oh, yeah, this is such a good article, Richard. It really is, and I love it. But it's really personal as well for me. So it looks at, I mean, the obvious ones that we talk about, about how looking looking perfect, looking like super mum, and um, that you've got it all under control. But it also talks about um, how you feel. This is the experience of a new mum and how you feel about your baby. And um, when I was pregnant with my first child many, many years ago, um, a very wise uh, best friend of my mum's called Wendy, uh, who had four kids, um, just said to me, just just as I was very heavily, heavily pregnant, you know, Jenny, when you have your baby, uh, you might not love it straight away, but if you just give it time, you will. And I didn't really think about it at the time. And I had my first child, and I think that bit of advice probably saved my bacon because it, that was exactly how it happened for me, and I really had to give it time. And I thought all the other mums were cooing over their babies and feeling all these amazing feelings, and I felt very, very lonely in that. Um, so, yeah, it was a really good article that really brought up how you feel about your baby, not just whether you look like a white company advert. The thing about the baby blues is, I mean, 25, 30 years ago, I mean, it was brushed under the carpet, wasn't it? And it was yeah. like, you know, mental health. It's, uh, it was, you know, my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation. It was first, known as suffering with your nerves, that's how it was referred to. I mean, do you think that's, <laughs> that's what it was, wasn't it? Suffers with the nerves. Yeah, I mean, yeah. with, with the baby yeah. blues, do you think that, that sort of stigma about it now, that mums and dads can open up about that if they're struggling? Do you think it's improved a lot or is there still a long way to go on that, do you think? Uh, I think it's improved a lot. And I love the fact you included dads. I know I know a dad that had um, the baby blues, if you like, or postnatal depression, and, and that really affected him quite deeply it's just that having a baby destroys everything in your life if you like in a good way in some ways but it knocks everything it doesn't improve a relationship and it doesn't improve stuff what it does is knock your life and you have to sort of create a life around it and so that's a, it's a shock for everybody whether we're feeling blue or not it's a it's ever such a shock and I think that how we deal with it and how um, society deals with it is, is really improving we've probably got a long way to go but it really is improving yeah, good stuff. And now let's go to the uh, a story which you found, I think it's on the Telegraph, which is I'm finally ready to talk about my secret battle with anxiety. Yeah, this is um, uh, someone who has been living with anxiety for 10 years and is talking about it now. So obviously writing an article in the Telegraph. Um, and, and really where we would use, I would use the phrase, not just surviving, but thriving. That would be uh, something I look at with um, mental health is, is that you can thrive through it. And what's happening at the moment is anxiety is spiking. It's on the rise and we're calling it re-entry syndrome, uh, which is where uh, because lockdown is easing, a lot of people live with anxiety and some people who've never experienced it before in their lives are starting to feel very anxious about uh, the changes the, how the world's going to look um, and one of the things I teach a, a lot is that one of the difficulties of living with anxiety is that our brains tell us an anxious story all the time and our bodies don't know the difference between what we're thinking and believing and what's real so our body goes into a stress or an anxious response because we are thinking stressful and anxious thoughts about something and when the reality is that quite often what's in front of us is is very normal and very peaceful um so yeah no it's a great article and uh, and, and again a, a little bit of a sign about how far we're coming that 10 years ago she didn't feel able to talk about it and now she's writing an article about it I mean, the thing is, isn't it, Jenny, we know, and we've seen the statistics many, many times, I mean, suffering with your mental health, it's going to affect one in four of us, and that figure is only going to get more. It's probably nearer to probably one point one in three getting towards now. It was always one in four 20 years ago. And anxiety itself mm. is one of those conditions which has such a broad spectrum, isn't it? At one end, it could be literally yeah. you can't breathe, and you're breathing into a paper bag, you can't go out. At the other end of the spectrum, it could just be, you know, 
returning back to the office after 14 weeks working from home and being around other people is giving you a bit of anxiousness and you may get a, a rash on yourself or hives or, or your shingles yes. may come out. I mean, it, that's the thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's a physical manifestation of something which is triggered emotionally through your emotions and your well-being. Yes, yes, absolutely. And wh what you said so brilliantly there, Richard, is that it has a massive spectrum. It's also understanding that this is also part of life, is that nothing I teach or anyone gives you is going to make our lives not bumpy. That is life. You know, how do we make our bodies strong? We make life difficult for our bodies. We run up stuff and lift heavy stuff and it responds with growth. And it's exactly the same for how we are as a person, is that the challenges in life allow us to grow, to learn more about ourselves to learn more skills and our mental health just like our physical health we it is something we have to show up for we have to show up for it like we have to show up for the gym we have to put in our practices and do our work and, and our, we can we can deal with our mental health in the same way as we deal with our physical health and i think that's something that we we often don't get is that it is uh, it's not a guarantee of a perfect life and it is something that we all have to work at and your final story, I love this one, a bit of mm, people who meditate are more aware of their unconscious brain. Yeah, oh, I love this. No, it's mm. fabulous. Because one of the things I talk about a lot, seriously, is that there's a, there's a lot of mindfulness is a massive word at, at the moment, has been for a while. But in many ways, there's a lot of dumbing down, really, of, of um, what, the, what its root um, was and so I say I talk about meditation not mindfulness and um, uh, one of the things we're looking at um, Richard is that we are it's understanding that our, we are run unconsciously on so many levels because we're so busy thinking that we don't notice how our body is responding so someone does something and we respond in anger or irritability um, uh, without even if you like thinking about it and so this is looking at what, how people who meditate um, are much more aware of their unconscious drivers than people who don't and that allows us to do something Thing that I think is really important, which is put a space between what's just happened in our in our reality, in our perception, and how we react to it. And that gives us a chance to change how we react to things and to be more peaceful and kind and calm in our immediate response. So yeah, and it, it was from the new scientist. It's got science written all over it. It's got so, science, uh, a bit of science. It felt like a really science written all over it. So yes, yes. So it's a serious I mean, article. Um, go on. The thing is, I mean, our brains, I mean, they are hugely complex things, aren't they? And But the fact of the matter is we only use 10% of our brains. And, you know, there are many, many mm -hmm. scientists and people from the world of sort of religion as well and scientists uh, who differ on a lot of things. But the one thing scientists and religion both agree on is as human beings, we probably underutilize our brains and we don't. There's something gone wrong in our evolution that we're, we've got this amazing thing in the top of our heads that we very, very lose little of. Something has not gone right in evolution. Oh, I, I, I might reframe that and say we are evolving into it as opposed to something's gone wrong and we're missing it. Is that I, 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 I don't think that it's our brain that we will evolve into. So there's this really tiny little exercise I ask people to do, which is simply shut their eyes and see whether they can find a space just for a millisecond where they're not thinking. And if they're not thinking, if you're not thinking, who are you? And that allows people to notice, hopefully, that there is something within them, this sort of presence, this kind of thing that's universal, that they know is there, but isn't a thought about what is there. And it's that that will evolve. And I, I think, I believe, I hope, our brain usage, if you like, will evolve as we become much more conscious of, of that presence, that bit of us um, that is who we truly are, which is our, our, um, our conscious, consciousness as the organising force. I'm fascinated by the, 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 the human brain in terms of using it. I did a, a test once, Jenny, which was basically mm. um, because I'm, I'm what they call mixed-handed. So I'm not ambidextrous, uh, but I've got no dominant left or right side. So when I do a task uh -huh. for the first time, my brain has to decide which hand or leg I'm going to use for it. And I've tried to explain this to people, and it, it's quite a strange concept because some things I might not have done before, I have to make a, my brain has to make an unconscious decision about which hand is going to go out to do it. 
So, for example, take, wow. cr take cricket, for example. I bat left-handed, but I bowl right-handed. Mm -hmm. I write right-handed, but I do all, uh -huh. rack, all sports left-handed. So, literally, I might open a jar with a left hand, but I'll hold a phone with a right It's all over the shop, but basically my brain, when you do, like, where the heat sensor is about what's the dominant side, mine's right in the middle. There is no dominant side to my brain. That's so interesting. But you know that you know, Richard. There is a theory, seriously, a theory, um, uh, that uh, the the way that the crown of your head on your hair moves uh, points to the side of your body that is dominant. And it'd be very interesting to see whether you have a double crown and, I think and I, one I think, going one way and one going the other. I think I have. I think I have got a double crown. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah, I think I have. I think I've been told that. Uh, listen, it's been fantastic. Well, we've really got deep there at 10 to 8 in the morning on for the science, haven't we, Jenny? <laughs> you can come back. <laughs> uh, oh, great thanks. stuff. I really appreciate it. That's uh, Jenny. Wasn't she good? Didn't you enjoy I enjoyed that. Uh, so some great stories that Jenny has picked out the papers for us. I'm sure she will back, be back on the show before us. Listen, producer Jenna is producing today.